The Remedial Herstory Project is a nonprofit working to get women's history into the primary and secondary history curriculum. To help us meet our goal, we produce media, lesson plans, and so much more. You can check it out on our website, www.remedialherstory.com. Our project is funded through grants and by patrons, potentially like you. Thank you to our patrons, Jeff, Barbara, Brooke, Christian, Kent, Jenna, Nancy, Megan, Leah, Mark, Nicole, Alicia, Katia, Michelle, Jessica, Laura, Jackie, Annabelle, Dawn, and Megan. If you would like to join these wonderful people and become a patron, you can head over to patreon.com and become a supporter of the Remedial Herstory Project. You too can help us reform education and allow women to be seen, heard, and complicated. Hey, Kelsey. Hey, Brooke. Want to tell everyone what's happening in today's episode? No, Brooke. I want you to tell me what's <laughs> happening in today's episode. Yes! Oh my gosh, I had the chance of talking to an awesome woman. And we're going to talk about women in business in England in the 16th century. Shut up. I'm so excited. Yeah, yeah. Let's get into this. Hello, and welcome to Remedial Her Story, the other 50% the podcast that explores what happened to the women in history class. Now, here's your host, Kelsey Brooke Eckert, and her partner in crime, Brooke Neva Sullivan. In this episode, we are asking, how did 16th century English women manage businesses? And we are joined by Dr. Catherine Coe. Yeah, so I got to talk to Dr. Catherine Coe um, and interview her, which was really, really fun. And she gave us a lot of information about women in business in the 16th century. But I'm curious what you know about women in business, Kels. Very, very little. Like in a lot of cases. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, the role is reversed. I know, the role is reversed. But seriously, like, I don't, if you ask me, okay, so 16th century, uh, like, yeah. New world is discovered. Women are homemakers. They are churchgoers. They are moms. Like, that's where my brain goes. I think I it's mean, valid. That, they got, were all of those things. You've got some queens that are pretty badass, but... Okay, some women in power. Some women in power. What do you think I don't that know they... Like, the average women, you know? Like, that's, like, the yeah. thing. It's, it's tough, because I think we all of us go immediately in our brains... To like, what would a job, what would a woman be allowed to do? Right. And that was where my brain initially went. And then talking to um, Catherine, it was really learning about like what not only women were allowed to do, but what they ended up doing out of necessity. Hmm. So there's this great quote, um, necessity is the mother of invention. And I really think that like that applies to women in this century so much because hmm. a lot of them maybe didn't have husbands that would have protected them or kept them, you know, in financial wealth or in, you know, from financial ruin. Their fathers might have been responsible for them. So Catherine actually shed a lot of light on careers that I would have never thought women held at this time period or were allowed to hold, which is really cool. And she shares a ton of resources and books um, towards the end of our conversation that, like, I 100% put into my Amazon cart <laughs> by the That's time awesome. we were done. Yeah, it was great. That's awesome. Well, let's have her introduce herself to our audience. Yes, take it away, Catherine. Well, my name is Catherine Coe, and I'm an associate professor of history at La Sierra University, which is also my alma mater. That's where I did my undergraduate degree. I did a double major in history and English literature. So it was nice to go back home in, um, in order to place my career somewhere that I knew and was really my intellectual, um, the place of my intellectual beginnings. Um, but I earned a PhD from the University of California, Riverside, after doing a master's degree at the University of Cambridge in England. And so I've had the benefit of a varied education. I currently teach um, quite a few different subjects within the field of history. So I'm mostly a church historian. I look at the history of the Christian church during the early modern period, particularly in England. But there's also politics and business mixed in with my studies because my doctoral dissertation was on the relationship between St. John's College, Oxford, and its benefactors, the Merchant Tailors Company in London. 
I'm kind of able to, to touch on a lot of different topics. So I teach the church history courses at last year. I also teach European history courses and world history courses. I teach global history um, to freshmen, which is a really fun class because for many students, that is the only history class that they will take <laughs> during their time in their university studies. So it's fun to introduce them to the study of history at a tertiary level. So how did you become interested in researching women in this time period? So I sort of fell into it. I did not initially intend to study women at all. In fact, when you look at my doctoral dissertation, I am studying dead white men (laughs) very clearly. I'm looking at an Oxford college, um, which in the 16th century, Oxford colleges did not accept women into them. Typically, the only members of the college who were allowed to be married was the president. And if you wanted to teach at a college or be a student there, you could not be married. So the only interactions that these boys and men had with women were typically prostitutes, um, innkeepers, and um, and women in the marketplace, as it were. It's the same for the Merchant Tailors Company. Even though Merchant Tailors were allowed to be married and they had wives and daughters, they uh, did not allow women into that particular guild. So I had no expectations of seeing women in the archives, quite frankly. I thought of women's studies as being entirely separate from what I was looking at. I went to graduate school in the early 2000s and So I had this very, I guess, patriarchal view of history that there was women's studies and then there was history. And over time, I've seen that this is absolutely not the case and that women are everywhere and they are in the archives and they're doing things and they're engaged (laughs) in their lives, Um, even during periods when we think of women as not holding as much power as they do now. So as I was studying for my doctoral dissertation, I kept running across women showing up and being um, considered a problem by the men that I was studying. For example, I am currently working on an edition of letters by a gentleman named Sir William Cordell. He's master of the roles for Elizabeth I, and he's the visitor of St. John's College at Oxford. And he wrote a little over 80 letters to the college and peppered throughout the letters are his attempts to help the college deal with financial situations that they've gotten into with women where women were owed money by the college and they appealed to him to help um, extract this money from the college. So these are women who are really taking charge of their financial lives. Um, Some of these women are engaged in business. Uh, Some of them are widows who have pensions that they've been promised, inherit- inheritances um, as well. So it's it's been a lovely surprise to engage with engage with women in this way when it, it was unintended to begin with. That's incredible. What interesting letters you must be reading too. That's fascinating. And so what time period were those letters captured in? These letters are from the 1550s up until the 1580s. And um, they really begin in the 1560s, but they're relating to, to incidents that occurred in the 1550s. So we're looking at the Elizabethan period in England. So England is being run by a woman. Uh, so the Queen of England is the person that's in charge. But women still are working against um, prejudices, both in the law as well as in society. So it's an interesting time period when you're considering women because the most important uh, politician of the time is a female, but she's gaining a lot of power. She's asserting her power by stating that she has the heart of a man, the famous quote. Um, Thank you for sharing. And so what is the 16th century in London like for women, you know, as we're starting to learn a little bit more about the women in charge? Yeah, so it's different depending on uh, your social and your economic status. And I think that that's pretty typical (laughs) across the board. So um, if you're an aristocratic woman, you have some more power in some ways. You have more ability to influence politics. So you could be a court lady and you could work directly with the queen. You could influence your husband. There's more of a likelihood that your parents would have hired 
a governess or someone to teach you how to read and write. Okay. Um, And so your business had to do mostly with the household that you were in and its relationship to power. So aristocratic women were in charge of essentially running the household, making sure that you hired a good cook and that, um, that when your servant went to the market, they weren't cheating you, things of that nature. If you're from a lower economic status, so if you're a bourgeois woman, so if you're in the middle classes, um, you may take part in your husband's business. So you might actually be working very closely with him if he's a member of a guild. If you are unmarried, if you are a widow or you are single, that meant that you could engage in your own business. So particularly widows, a lot of these women became midwives, which was a very lucrative business to go into. Okay, Um, there's a really fantastic study that was actually done about midwives. And it was, I think it was 1,200 women that were um, written about by Doreen Evenden. And she looks at these licensed midwives who made their own cash, (laughs) essentially. Um, One in particular, a woman named Elizabeth Whip. She was wealthy enough to leave a will, which most women did not leave wills, but she was able to do so. And she left significantly large legacies. Interestingly enough, she left legacies to other women. um, And in particular, her unmarried daughter, so she was trying to give her a leg up in life. So she knew it was hard to be a woman. So being a middle-class woman gave you more opportunities to be directly involved in business. If you were a poor woman, you were forced to be involved in work, quite literally. There was actually a statute it's called the Statute of Artificers from 1563. And it stated that all unmarried women between 12 and 40 could be forced into service. So they could be forced to become maids, essentially. This was not a good place to be if you were a woman, because you could get a a pleasant master who treated you well and gave you a a nice room and board, okay? Um, Or you could be treated terribly. And unfortunately, um, many women who went into service were abused. So they were abused physically and sexually. Um, And if you became pregnant from that situation, then you would be the one that was punished by society, much more so um, than your abuser. So service was not a good place to be, but it is where most poor women found themselves. And they kind of patched together a livelihood um, by doing different acts of service for the community. The lowest of Um, this group would have been women who were uh, pushed into prostitution. And so for many women in prostitution, this was not their first choice, but rather it was kind of the, the last option that they had. So for example, if you had been a servant girl who had been, um, had been raped by your master and you'd become pregnant, then you would be cast off in society and And prostitution may have been the only way that you could earn money um, as a result of your your situation. So um, that was sort of the the end of the road, as it were, for um, women who had been in abusive situations. The Remedial Herstory Project is hosting its second annual Summer Educators Retreat to help teachers integrate more women's history and literature into their curriculum. Studies show that educators currently teach women's history between 5 and 20% of the time, with 5% being the plurality. Our retreat will feature speakers from around the world and be available online and in person, and provide educators with dozens of packaged lesson plans, videos, and other tools and resources to get women into every unit of their curriculum. The best part is that in-person attendees will get to network and relax with peers who are passionate about working to incorporate the diverse history of half the population all but left out of the history classroom. The retreat will take place at New Hampshire's Common Man Inn and Spa at the heart of the White Mountains of New Hampshire, the best place to be in August. The retreat will take place between August 8th and 10th. Interested people can learn more on our website at www.remedialherstory.com slash summer dash educators dash retreat. The options were very limited, it sounds like, and that's, wow. So... 
How do women find a place in business? I mean, you talked a little bit about the widows really kind of taking a, a hold of business and being kind of drivers, but what types of businesses do they have? Like, what were they running? Um, so you could be a loan shark. Interestingly enough, this was a really great way for women to earn money if they had some sort of an inheritance. So uh, whether that was from a parent who'd passed away or from a husband who'd passed away. Um, so typically spinsters and widows would be the ones who participated um, in in the loaning of money. Um, this was looked down upon, of course, as usury by uh, many of the more religious types. But uh, it was still practice. Um, there's a great diary that was left. Uh, it's a financial diary by a woman named Joyce Jeffries. And she um, lived in the early 17th century from 16. Um, well, the diary is from 1638 to 49. But um, she was making quite a lot of money uh, doing doing loans, loaning out money to people. And the way that she was able to do that is she had inherited legacies from her father and her mother and her stepbrother and her cousin. And so she was making quite a lot of cash. She was making 650 pounds a year from these practices, um, which is a hefty sum at the time. Um, one of the things I love actually about her financial diary is you can see that she then took the money that she had and intentionally invested in other women who were in business. So if she needed to buy something by someone who was a craftsperson, she would seek out a woman who was doing that particular craft and purchase from them. So you can see women uplifting other women uh, within this, which is, which is really fantastic. Um, you also see women as patrons. Um, and this, at first, doesn't seem like... Um, women uh, participating in business, but it is because they're investing in their future. So you see women who are patronizing those in the arts or those in politics, um, but that gives them access to things. So if you're, if you're giving patronage to a courtier or a politician or a famous writer, then you're giving yourself access to power. And many times you'll see in the introductions to pamphlets and to books from this time, uh, dedications to women who had supported these writers um, and given them money in order to do their craft. And that could elevate a woman's status in society. I've also found instances of women acting as patrons in order to assist their children, which is an investment for them as well. So in my own research, I've been looking at this family called the Herrick family. And um, the matriarch of the family is a woman named Joan Herrick. And she's uh, she, there are all these letters between herself and her son's tutor at the University of Oxford. I actually kind of fell into studying Joan because of my doctoral dissertation on St. John's College. I saw these letters. I thought, this is very fascinating. And she's writing to her son's tutor, who happens to be the father of Christopher Wren, the architect who um, had designed St. Paul's Cathedral in London. And he was also named Christopher Wren, so Christopher Wren the Elder. And she's writing to, to Wren and saying, um, and, tr and trying to, to patron him. She's trying to support him in his own scholarship. She's trying to actually get him a position at a different college that would have been lucrative for him. Didn't work out. But She's writing to him as as um, someone who's who's supporting him and um, kind of assisting him in his livelihood. But this also assists her son because he has a tutor that's going to be supportive of him, and he's also funneling information about the son to the mother. So the mother can actually write to him and ask for information on her child and try to um, try to find out what he's up to while he's away at college. So lots of different things that women could um, could do. Like I mentioned, they could also work as um, as midwives. They um, many women participated in crafts as well. If you see a lot, you see a lot of widows kind of taking over um, different ki kinds of skilled labor um, businesses from their their husbands after they passed away. So they could participate in things like blacksmithing and stuff like that. Um, I remember in, when I was a teenager, there was a film that came out called A Knight's Tale. It was, it was very exciting. It starred Heath Ledger and there was a female blacksmith and she was a widow. And there's reason for that stereotype. Uh, there's, there's truth in it. Um, but women were also engaged in matchmaking, which um, is 
another form of business because if you can match your child with someone from a wealthier family or a family of higher status, you can bring wealth to yourself as well. So I think when we're thinking about women in business, it's important to broaden our concepts of what business is. Um, and rather than just kind of thinking very narrowly about these, uh, these categories, but that uh, women in their lives, even in their domestic lives, are participating in business, in, in economy, as it were. That's fascinating. And um, Joan sounds really interesting. So, you know, I'll have to follow up with you on, on more about her. I'm curious, is there, you know, women from this time period that were leaders that in their communities? Is there people that others looked up to that they really um, saw kind of as a footprint or like a blueprint for how they should go down that path? Yeah, absolutely. So you see women who um, are, first of all, in their communities who are leaders. So the local wife of the local landlord um, would be considered a leader in the community and was expected to be religiously upright, for example, as I was mentioning midwives before. So midwives are very important during this time period because uh, they're the ones who are birthing babies. They're with women at the most uh, trying times of their lives. The, the moment of life or death, really, for most women. And so they were very much uh, looked up to as well. So it again, it depends on your socioeconomic status. Um, if you are a servant girl in a household, it's the lady of the house that you're answering to, um, not much more than the master of the house, because it's the lady of the house who's running the household economy. So it really depends on... Um, when you're looking up or you're looking up to. And then ultimately, like I mentioned, the queen, um, she's sort of this symbol of, of womanhood, but she's also taken on these masculine characteristics in order to gain power. She gives speeches about being her father's daughter. She, of course, never mentions her mother because her mother was considered to be a traitor who's executed. And so there's that. But you also see the queen utilizing some feminine attributes in order to be in symbols in order to to gain power and to gain autonomy as well there have been studies that have been done on the ways that elizabeth i has been painted and how she utilized things like pearls and gloves and fans in place of um, armor or swords um, or other um, militaristic items that men would have been painted with. So she's being painted in a very feminine light and is drawing um drawing power from that in ways that in ways that men could not participate in. So it really depended on your your place in society. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Catherine, I really appreciate you taking the time to teach us a little bit more about this topic and this century and um how women were in business. And it sounds like um, quite a few women were in business. So there's absolutely, you know, women in history that are doing incredible things. So thank you so much for sharing this with us and, and your passion around it. Is, yeah. um, is there anything I didn't ask you that you really want to share on this topic? Yeah, I'd kind of like to go back to Joan Herrick, actually. Sure, because, let's do that. Yeah, because she was, she also participated in um, the religious marketplace. So at this time in London, this is post-reformation. So you have discussions uh, about what is right and good in the eyes of the Lord, and you have various different groups. So you have Calvinists um, who become known as the hotter sort of Protestants, or um, in a derogatory term, they were called Puritans, right? And Joan is part of that particular group. And we see her supporting ministers who are also part of that group by buying their books or recommending them to other people. There's a letter where she's recommending a particular minister's writings, Daniel Vautier, to her husband, um, saying that you need to read this on a regular occasion. We also see her son writing to her from college saying, I've met this particular religious gentleman. Could you please support him? Could you give him assistance? And it's very clear that the assistance that he's asking for is by financial. So um, you see her supporting people um, monetarily, which is is part of of this economy because for many ministers, they weren't paid a great deal. 
And so they needed patrons, they needed people to support what they were doing. And so it's wonderful to see a woman participating in that. She also got herself in trouble this way. Um, it was said that she had participated in an iconoclasm in actually destroying um, some religious um, some religious items that she saw as being too quote quote unquote Catholic um, for a woman who was who was uh, kind of on the hotter sort of Protestantism. And she ended up in a lawsuit as a result of it as well. So, uh, so yes, I just, I think it's one of the, the fun things about looking at women in history. It's also one of the frustrating things is that you do have to see life creatively. Um, but one thing that that's really done for me is it's helped me to give value to things, to activities and to work in my life that has typically been considered quote unquote women's work um, that isn't valued monetarily by society, but is very much part of the economies that we live in. Um, and so it's 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 a nice transfer from studying history to to living it as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, thank you for highlighting that. And so are there primary sources that people can have access to to learn more about Joan or some of these other women that you mentioned? Yeah, absolutely. There's a really fantastic book called, um, I think it's Early Modern Women, um, uh, Early Modern Women Writing um, that I came across and I'm kicking myself because I didn't write the, oh. That's okay. Well, if you, if you send it to us, we'll include it in the links too, to the episode. So if you do find it, feel free to email. Definitely. Um, And there's another, there's a book by Amy Erickson. It's called Women and Property in Early Modern England. And that's a great book. Um, For more of a popular history, look at these types of things. Antonia Fraser's The Weaker Vessel is, uh, is fantastic. And it contains a lot of, a lot of anecdotes and stories that I think people would find interesting. And then on Midwifery, the book by Doreen Evenden uh, is really fantastic. She goes into, um, into all sorts of of, of sources. There's also information on female coroners. Uh, there were women who were called searchers and they were coroners in London. Um, so I believe Paul Griffiths has written about that in um, the structure of prostitution in early modern London. He writes about prostitutes, but I, I believe he also writes about searchers too. So there's, there's lots of different books that you can, can look at. Yeah. It's fascinating because it, it, the, I think the understanding many of us might have is that you know, women were more homemakers or wives and, and that they played the very narrow women's sphere role mm-hmm. within that time period. But it sounds like they were everywhere and doing great oh, work. They were. And there's a great book by Evelyn Welch called Shopping in the Renaissance. Um, and it, it looks at, at Italy during this time period and how Italian women were very involved in the marketplace, both uh, working within the marketplace and then utilizing the marketplace to their to the benefit of their households. So uh, yeah, women are absolutely everywhere. We're half of history. So I love it. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it, Catherine. Um, so um, I think that will wrap it up for us. So I really appreciate you um, sharing more on these topics and, and joining us on the podcast. It really means a lot to us. Yeah, absolutely. It was lovely to be invited. So thank you so much. Of course. Thanks so much for listening to Remedial Her Story, the other 50%. Please subscribe, rate, and review wherever you listen to your podcasts to bring more voices to the conversation. We really appreciate that effort. Until next time.